Thanks for that gracious introduction, Andrew. I want to thank George Washington. Uh, I want to thank State of the Plate for holding this great event. Uh, it's, I think it's wonderful to be able to get farmers and producers and restaurateurs together. I think that's the beginning of uh, a wonderful solution for our food system. I want to echo what Andrew said. I didn't come to Food Inc. as a food expert. Um, <clears throat> I was really just wanting to find out where our food came from, how it got to our plate, what it does to us, what it does to our environment. Uh, I thought that would be an interesting idea for a film. I had no idea how difficult that story would be to tell. Um, ultimately, so much of the industrial world was not really interested in talking to me. I spent about six months pursuing dozens and dozens of corporations. They were all very pleasant. Uh, we met for dinner at times, and I was really anxious to be able to tell their story from their point of view. Uh, but ultimately, uh, in the film, we list about eight companies or six or eight companies that didn't want to talk to us. In reality, it was dozens and dozens and dozens of companies that didn't want to talk. And I was very disappointed and developed relationships with numbers of these people. But I realized, the more I, I kept realizing that this was really off limits to us as consumers. And I was beginning to feel more and more as I was starting to make this film that the industry was not very interested in the consumer knowing where our food comes from. And I th thought that was a mistake. I thought we should all be able to partake in this conversation. Um, and I think the more I was rejected, the more I felt that this was really a necessary film to be making. Um, one of the things that inspired me to begin with is I read Eric Schlosser's book, Fast Food Nation, and I uh, became interested in that subject, but quickly realized uh, that fast food was something that people recognized was a danger. I, I was thinking, Eric wrote Fast Food Nation uh, in 01. It, it developed from an article in 1999 that he wrote in Rolling Stone. Uh, so he hadn't really thought about fast food in 1999. Uh, by 01, he wrote Fast Food Nation, and by 05, I was thinking of doing a film and realized that so many people already knew about the dangers of fast food, though Americans were still eating it in great abundance. Uh, but I was amazed that in a six-year period, that something that Eric didn't even know about, so many people had learned about. So things can change quickly. Uh, and I realized that when I went to sell my project to a major studio, uh, I was talking to an executive explaining uh, the movie I wanted to make, and she looked at me and said, you know, I'm a vegetarian. If you want to avad, bad, avoid bad food, just don't go, you know, buy it. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, well, it's not quite that simple, but she was not that interested. And then two days later, there was the E. coli and the spinach scare, and I got a phone call saying, you know, maybe we are interested. So, uh, and I think ultimately the point of Eric's book was that all food, you know, his book was about much more than fast food. It was about the industrialization of our food system. Uh, and ultimately, the supermarket is now filled with fast food. Uh, and it's food that's affecting all of us. Uh, whether, you know, well, even if you're growing your food in your garden and never going to the supermarket, you're paying for this fast industrialized food. Um, so, and I think it's the, the consolidation that's been taking place that Eric was also writing about uh, that became one of my biggest concerns. And I'm gonna show my second clip here. We're up to something new. Did, did I hear something interesting was yeah. happening? Um, since fixed food, um, usually when I finish a film, what happens is I might talk about it for a few weeks and I go on to the next. But what was really interesting uh, is there was something different about the world of food that I found really sidetracked me. Uh, it's a subject that so many people are interested in. Uh, I was very surprised by the level of interest in food. I had no, uh, I hadn't realized what kind of a response Food Inc. would get. Uh, 
ultimately it played into this incredibly growing food movement that was just exploding because of Eric, uh, Eric's book and Michael Pollan's book, Omnivore's Dilemma. Uh, and I realized that you know, uh, I'd go around and speak at colleges that people are totally concerned and it's made up of students uh, who want to change the system and it's made up of moms who want to feed good food to their kids. So we've created, uh, we're about to launch a website called Fix Food, uh, which will be short videos that will help tell people how they can take action to help change the food system. Uh, and we'll be launching in the next few months, and there'll be specific things that people can do uh, to help bring about change. And I think people are really interested in change. And um, so and it's called fixfood.org. So uh, it will be launching in the near future, and hopefully you'll check it out. Thank so. you for being patient. I think we've managed to uh, fix our AT channels, gentlemen. Can we uh, show the next clip? This is one of our latest DC Central Kitchen. And we may well see Laura's inbox in a minute, see who she was emailing last night. Shag. What do you think? One of the things as a filmmaker is like when you're making a film about food, how do you make something that will be entertaining to an audience? Uh, this was a real challenge for us. You know, uh, I guess we're it was using animation you helped. <laughs> Thank you for being patient, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> When McDonald's is the largest purchaser of ground beef in the United States and they want their hamburgers to taste everywhere exactly the same, uh, they change how ground beef is produced. The McDonald's Corporation is the largest purchaser of potatoes and one of the largest purchasers of pork, chicken, tomatoes, lettuce, even apples. These big, big fast food chains want big suppliers, and now there are essentially a handful of companies controlling our food system. In the 1970s, the top five beef packers controlled only about 25% of the market. Today, the top four control more than 80% of the market. You see the same thing happening now in pork. Even if you don't eat at a fast food restaurant, you're now eating meat that's being produced by this system. You look at the labels and you see farmer this, farmer that. It's really just three or four companies that are controlling the meat. Uh, I was... You know, when you see what happened in meat production, that was pretty startling to me. I didn't realize uh, the amount of consolidation that has taken place. Because uh, when you look in the supermarket, there are all these different labels. And what I realized is it was not only true of meat. It was true of all aspects uh, of our food production. There's been incredible consolidation. Uh, and I remember when I was growing up, President Eisenhower went after AMP uh, because he thought it was bad for one corporation to have too much power. AMP had a fraction of the power of these corporations. And Eisenhower was saying it was bad for American business. It wasn't that the prices were too high, but it was bad for competition. It was not good for the public. Unfortunately, that's not the atmosphere that we're living in uh, at the moment. I met one rancher during the making of the film that was not in the film, but I remember him. He, was, he sort of looked like the Marlboro Man. He was sitting on his horse in Colorado. And he said to me, you know, um, I 
have these grass-fed cattle, and I have so few places I can sell my meat to, and I make a much better product, but I don't have many choices. There's so few buyers. And he said, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I always thought we were so much better than the Soviet Union because we didn't have a state system who told you what the price would be. You could go make a better product and have places to sell it. He said, today I feel like we've become our own worst nightmare. Um, and I saw that happening in this food industry. Uh, I think when you consolidate food, we have very cheap prices, which is a great thing, and we all love that. But all of a sudden, we start to have a lack of diversity. We have one kind of apple that's being sold. That We have the genetics of one kind of chicken that's being sold, one kind of cow. And this sort of, uh, this, you know, compressing of diversity creates a certain brittleness in the system. And I think ultimately, when you have so little variety, uh, the system really tightens up and the balance between specialization and diversification seems to have gotten out of balance in the system that we have today. Uh, and as we, see, as we see this happening, we also see new diseases that are forming. Um, ultimately, there are new types of salmonella that are out there because of these incredible feedlots uh, and CAFOs that we have. During the making of Food, Inc., I filmed with Carol Morrison and her chicken farm. And I remember walking through, well, the place just smelled terrible. And I, I actually find it hard to eat industrial chicken after being at Carol's uh, farm. It just was not very appealing to, to be smelling what I was smelling and to have to step over dead chickens. And I'm happy to say I was back at Carol's farm yesterday uh, filming, and she's made a transition. Uh, she switched from that industrial form of farming to raising free-range uh, hens. Uh, and the only problem I had yesterday in filming was that these hens would kept jumping on my lap as we were trying to talk. So that was a very different experience, and the air smelled great, and you could just sense the genetic difference in these animals. Uh, they weren't falling over in front of you, gasping for air. Um, there are other new diseases that are cropping up around because of our new system. Uh, e. coli uh, 0157 is something that uh, is a brand new disease uh, that's come about because we have these giant feedlots, we're feeding them corn because the corn's cheap, uh, and ultimately there's this new disease that wasn't there before. Um, obviously, we've always had foodborne illnesses. This is not new, but the difference is now one cow can get into thousands of hamburgers and be shipped to states all over the world, uh, all over the country at least, sorry. Um, and it's true with those, those eggs that were just shipped out from Jack DaCosta's farms. Uh, they were being shipped all over the United States. So it used to be one farmer might be a problem for his community. Today it's a problem for the whole, the whole country. So we have to be that much more careful. The consolidation is taking place on many levels, beyond just what's in the supermarket. It's also taking place, uh, we're having, you know, ultimately fewer and fewer varieties of meats, vegetables, and we have fewer and fewer farmers and fewer and fewer crops. And one of the people that also inspired me was Michael Pollan uh, with Omnivore's Dilemma, which was coming out just as we were starting. And uh, I thought his talking about corn was really something that was very interesting. And I'm going to play, hopefully play my third clip. clip. We encourage farmers to grow as much corn as they could grow, to get big, to consolidate. We subsidized farmers by the bushel. We produced a lot of corn, and they came up with uses for it. We are now engineering our foods. We know where to turn to for certain traits, like mouthfeel, and then flavors. And we bring all of these pieces together and engineer new foods that don't stale in the refrigerator, don't develop rancidity, of course, the biggest advance in recent years was high fructose corn syrup. You know, I would venture to guess, if you go and look on the supermarket shelf, I'll bet you 90% of them would contain either a corn or soybean ingredient. And most of the time, it'll contain both.
Corn is a great raw material. You get that big, fat kernel of starch. And you can break that down and reassemble it, and you can make high fructose corn syrup, and you can make maltodextrin and diglycerides and xanthan gum and ascorbic acid. All, the, all those obscure ingredients on the processed food, it's remarkable how many of them can be made from corn. Plus, you can feed it to animals. Corn is the main component in feed ingredients. It's whether it's chicken, hogs, cattle, you name it. Increasingly, we're feeding the corn to the fish, whether we're eating the tilapia or the farm salmon. We're, we're teaching fish how to eat corn. The fact that we had so much cheap corn really allowed us to drive down the price of meat. I mean, the average American is eating over 200 pounds of meat per person per year, and that wouldn't be possible had we not fed them this diet of cheap grain. Um, just to tell you what kind of an expert I am about food, that I, I remember when I was a kid, farms had all these different animals and different crops on them, and I remember driving around thinking, gosh, what a coincidence, there's a cornfield and there's another cornfield, and I didn't realize why I kept seeing cornfields and soy fields until I started making this film. I just kept thinking it was, I just happened to be hitting a lot of corn by coincidence. Uh, today, more than half the land that uh, we use to grow food on in the United States is dedicated to corn and soy. Um, and it's not a coincidence, ultimately these two crops, uh, they had been subsidized greatly by the U.S. government. Today, probably those subsidies will fall away, but there's still incredible amounts of insurance that are going for farmers to grow these two crops. Uh, it's not really the farmers who profit by growing the crops, it's really the big consolidators. It's the Cargills, it's the Smithfields, it's the uh, McDonald's who are profiting uh, because they're getting a, a product that is cheaper than it costs to actually produce it because we're paying for it with our tax dollars. We're subsidizing uh, that crop. And that seems uh, to me unfortunate. Uh, why are we subsidizing food that is making us sick? Uh, what if we put 1% of our farm bill towards foods and vegetables uh, that make us healthy? If we did that, we could change uh, our communities and change the health of many Americans. And hopefully we'll start to, you know, we can push for that in the near future. Um, as Michael said, you know, ultimately we're making the carrots and the apples more expensive than the chips, and that's not a good thing for us. Um, we spend less of our paycheck on food today than at any time, which is something we all love as Americans. That's a great thing. A uh, hundred years ago, farmers are very productive. A hundred years ago, a farmer might produce 20 bushels of corn. Today, a farmer can produce uh, 200 bushels of corn on that same acre. So that's an incredible achievement. Um, but we're starting to understand uh, that there's a high cost to this low-cost food that you don't see when you go to the checkout counter. Um, and th there are externalities that are taking place. And today, we're not very sympathetic to the concept of externalities. Uh, we don't think corporations that produce pollution should have to pay for those pollutions. Uh, I disagree. I think there are real costs that should be connected to products that are being sold. The externalities that we're seeing in the food system is our water is being polluted. Uh, we have GE crops that are out there that are requiring more and more and more pesticides. And those pesticides are going into our water, into our soil, uh, and ultimately uh, we are going to have to pay the price for those pesticides. There are hypoxias in our water system. Large parts of the Gulf of Mexico are dead because of the runoff from this chemical system. Uh, the chemicals that are flowing down the Mississippi. There are areas in the Gulf that are larger than the state of Mississippi where there's no life that exists. I was just at the Chesapeake Bay when I was visiting Carroll, and I know there are large areas there that are dying off quickly as the runoff from those uh, chicken farms are going into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and I like to eat the seafood, and the, the fishermen are being put out of business. And that's another externality that we're paying for. The soil uh, is not being replenished as well. Half the topsoil of the state of Iowa, our best farm state, uh, is 
uh, has run off in the last hundred years. So this is not a sustainable form of agriculture. It takes the earth, the earth 18 months to replenish uh, our resources uh, for what we are producing each year. And again, that obviously can't go on. During the making of Food Inc., I went to film, uh, I wanted to film a strawberry patch, where a uh, strawberry field, where they have to use hazmat suits to go spray the strawberries. So farmers have to put on what look like space suits to go spray our food. And I'm thinking, do I want to eat strawberries when people have to wear space suits uh, to go spray them? I'm thinking, I'm not sure I want to eat that. Ultimately, what we're doing to the animals, and I'm sure Andrew, and this will be discussed later today, uh, they're living in miserable, terrible conditions. Uh, being on Carol's farm yesterday was a very different experience than being there uh, a few years ago. Um, we're having to pump so many antibiotics into these animals. Uh, it's frightening what's happening, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that a little later. Um, The CAFO system, it's because of these CAFOs uh, and because of the subsidized corn and the farm bill that we are eating more and more meat every year. Americans are eating 200 pounds of meat uh, per person per year. That's, if you put these animals together, nose to tail, chickens, pigs, and cows, it would stretch back and forth to the moon five times every year, the amount we eat. And if the world ate like we did, uh, that would be 30 times back and forth to the moon. Uh, and the, you know, I guess on some levels it's a concern because the world is starting to eat like we are. And it takes 20 times the amount of energy to create a plate with meat on it for dinner than a plate with vegetables. So I don't know if we can continue to eat like we are. I'm not a vegetarian. Uh, I know People from the industry have accused me of being a vegetarian. They've accused Eric of being a vegetarian, even though he starts out the film eating a hamburger. Uh, but I do think we're going to have to eat less meat if we do want to feed the world, because we can't go on. And especially, from my point of view, we have to eat less CAFO meat, uh, because it's not sustainable. But ultimately, for me, it was looking at what's happening to the workers that was as much of a concern as what's happening to the animals, because they're not being treated any better. Um, ultimately, I saw people who were doing very dangerous jobs for very low money. Most of them were illegal immigrants. Uh, the companies absolutely know they were illegal immigrants. Um, and they were working very hard and then generally being uh, paid no benefits and being, many of them being arrested, as you saw in the film. Um, when I went to Iowa State, uh, I was speaking to a bunch of ag students. And I asked them, what's the most important thing about becoming a farmer? And they said, uh, speaking Spanish. Uh, and I thought, that's really a product of our food system that uh, ultimately these jobs have become so dangerous, so low paid, that you know, even Americans out of work don't want these jobs. Uh, and I think that's, you know, unfortunate. I think you can tell a lot by a food system by who is growing and preparing that food. And unfortunately, jobs that used to be great jobs have become miserable jobs. Lastly, I think it's the consumer who is also paying the price of this food system and one of the externalities. Uh, the food is making us sick today. We consume 300 more calories than we did per day 20 years ago. Uh, Two-thirds of Americans are either overweight or obese. Most of those uh, calories, by the way, come from sodas. Uh, diabetes, uh, as we said in our film, one-third of all Americans born after the year 2000 will have early-onset diabetes. And one-half of all minorities born after the year 2000 will have early-onset diabetes. Uh, and this is going to cost us a fortune. Uh, so again, this cheap food is too expensive. Um, well, when I was a kid, uh, our food cost us 18% 18, 18 of our paychecks, uh, and medicine cost 5% of the paychecks. Today, our food is half of what it used to cost, but our medicine is now like more than triple what it costs. So in aggregate, if you think there's a connection between food and health, the cost has gone up. Um, 
John Stewart, I went on John Stewart and he said, well, if this food's so bad, why are we living longer than we've ever lived? Uh, and I think the fact is this food, it takes time for it to have an effect. And as we see with the diabetes situation, it's starting to come home to roost and it's going to be very costly. Um, one of the stories I was really happy to tell in Food Inc. You know, is the story of the Latino family uh, who was eating fast food and the father gets diabetes and the young girl uh, in the story was pre-diabetic. And that family was not aware of the dangers of that fast food. They were getting up at 6 a.m., coming home around 9, and it was very convenient. Uh, and they didn't have a lot of money and it was quick and they didn't have supermarkets in their town um, so they would have to drive 15 minutes to get to a supermarket. So they were eating this fast food, but ultimately the father was paying $500 a month for medicine. Uh, so that cheap food was costing, again, too much. Uh, since the movie, um, I'm happy to say that they have changed their diets. The father has stabilized, but still taking medication, but the young girl is now no longer pre-diabetic. So um, I think that's encouraging we can change and there are changes happening. Um, people ask me what was the most scary thing I saw during the making of Food Inc. And I have to say it was when I went to a hearing in Sacramento on whether we should label cloned meat. Uh, I didn't know of cloned meat when I was starting to uh, make Food Inc. But for me, the scariest part of that was when a representative from the meat industry stood up and said, I don't think it's in the interest of the consumer to be told what's in their food. It's too confusing. And I got goosebumps because I thought, you know, if you make a great product, shouldn't you advertise it, not hide it? Uh, and that's what I see happening in a lot of our food system. It was certainly happening uh, with the growth hormone in the milk. Uh, people were being sued for saying that they didn't have it in the milk. Uh, not only were we not labeling it, but you were suing people for saying it didn't exist in theirs. We had a march yesterday uh, in, right here in Washington to label genetically engineered foods. Um, 80% of all our processed food contains GE foods, uh, and yet we're not allowed to know it's in our food. Um, all of Europe labels their food. South Africa, which had the apartheid system, but they still, they've changed that, and they now label their GE food. And I've just heard that China is talking about labeling their GE food, but we are fighting it tooth and nail here because it's too confusing to the consumer to give them that information. Uh, I think that's wrong. Um, I'm going to play my last clip and move on. The fast food industry fought against giving you the calorie information. They fought against telling you if there's trans fat in their food. The meatpacking industry for years prevented country of origin labeling. They fought not to label genetically modified foods. And now 70% of processed food in the supermarket has some genetically modified ingredient. I think it's one of the most important battles for consumers to fight. Is, is the right to know what, what's in their food and how it was grown. Not only do they not want you to know what's in it, they have managed to make it against the law to criticize their products. Can, can you tell me how you've changed how you eat? Yeah, we, you're gonna, you probably have to call, talk to an attorney before you would put well, this in there. Well, you say this is, you know, we've stopped, yeah. you know. The, I know, but, yeah. but I could have the meat and poultry industry coming after me, and I really... Seriously, for saying that it's so... It depends I mean, on the it's, context. You're not, you're not saying I, someone else yeah, don't eat it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Robbie, the, but, but I get well, asked well, this well, all the time, really? and, God, and you know, my, initially my reaction was, I don't care, I let them sue me. Let them try and sue the mother of a dead child and see... It's pretty amazing that you can't say how you and your family. Well, the veggie libel laws would, are 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 different. The food industry has different protections than other industries do. 
We have a lot of questions about this mad cow disease. If you recall the case where Oprah was sued by the meat industry for something she said on her show. It has just stopped me cold from eating another burger. <laughs> Colorado, it's a felony if you're convicted under a veggie libel law. So you could go to prison for criticizing the ground beef that's being produced in the state of Colorado. There is an effort in several farm states to make it illegal to publish a photo of any industrial food operation, any feedlot operation. At the same time, they've also gotten bills passed that are called cheeseburger bills that make it very, very difficult for you to sue them. These companies have legions of attorneys, and they may sue, even though they know they can't win, just to send a message. I, um, I hadn't known all this when I started, and it was a little scary as I was finding out. And actually, I know today we have a representative from the Farmers and Ranchers Alliance that's going to be spending a lot of money talking about the system that we have. So hopefully uh, I've said everything that's legal to be said here. Um, I've spent, um, I spent more on legal fees for this film than all of my other films, probably uh, more than my other 15 films combined times three making this. And uh, there've been new laws introduced since. Uh, they haven't gone through to my knowledge, but. Uh, making it illegal to shoot any f uh, food processing plants from the road, uh, from public property. Uh, they're trying to make it a 30-year offense in certain states. I know Florida, they were trying to introduce something. I don't think it went through, though. Um, it's scary that that's the world, you know, I, I was found it unimaginable. That was the world when Barb Kowalczyk was telling me that she couldn't say what she, she felt uncomfortable saying what she eats. I was, uh, you hear my voice, I was kind of speechless. I didn't think that would be in the film. I didn't think the question would lead to anything. I was kind of shocked by that response and I found it scarier and scarier as I went on. But ultimately, I think we have to change our mentality in this country uh, from purely just short-term quarterly profits for companies to finding a way to add real value, not only for the, the stockholder, but for our community and the world we live in, to try to figure out how to make this uh, a better place, how to make healthier food, how to try to feed the world. Uh, we have you know, one billion people that are still going to bed hungry today. So uh, the industrial farm food system is saying we need this system to feed the world. Well, people are still going to bed hungry, and we have to figure out solutions. And uh, I think we all have to come together to figure out those solutions. Um, but I think, you know, after making Food Inc., I realized as people learn about their food, uh, they are ready to make changes. And the parallels with the tobacco company, I think, are great. Uh, that tobacco was saying they had a product that was not harmful, uh, that people should continue smoking it, and people did continue smoking it. Uh, but as we gradually learn that that product kills people, 50% of people who smoke die of lung cancer. Um, and ultimately, people, as they realize the consequences of that product, they stop smoking, the government put taxes on it, and it saves all of us a lot of money. I know we have uh, financial problems, and that's one way that we saved money for all of us. And hopefully we can figure out how to do something. Uh, as people become aware of what's happening with our food system, we can start to make big changes. And I think it's events like this where you know, producers, farmers, producers, restaurateurs come together that we can start to hear about the great solutions that's happening in our system and we can make these changes. And I, I want to end with a quote from Gandhi uh, who says, anyone who thinks they're too small to make a change has never slept in a room with a mosquito. So thank you very much.